Hello coaches, welcome back to another Modern Soccer Coach interview. Joining us this week is Chris Ramsey. I'm sure you're all aware of him, former Tottenham QPR and also Charleston Battery here in the US. Delighted to have him on, one of the leaders in player development over the past 10-15 years. Some of his insight here on player development, coach development environments, absolutely outstanding. If you enjoy it, please give it a like. Please make sure you subscribe. And also, if you haven't checked out the Modern Soccer Coach Game Model webinar, the replay is now available on the link below. Thanks so much. Here is Chris. Enjoy. Chris, thanks so much for joining me on the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. Really, really excited to have you on. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honour to be on. I'm going to ask the first question about your playing background. A lot of a lot of play a lot of coaches are influenced by, you know, their playing experiences. I actually didn't know you played in the '83 Cup final. <laughs> the last night, I stuck it on YouTube last night, right back against uh, Stapleton and Whiteside. Yeah, and Arnold Muren and people like that. How how did that shape your your kind of coach philosophy that we talk about today? Uh, listen, my coach philosophy wasn't really just uh, by uh, my playing career. My playing career obviously allowed me to see pitches on the pitch um, that more quickly than had I not. You know, I'm not saying that everybody has to play. Um, but I think it's important that people play at some level, whether it be in the park or whether it be international level. I think it's easier to see pitches once you've been on the pitch. Uh, now, my, my, most of my, my initial love for um to, the way football was played was uh came from obviously the brazil team in the 1970 1970 final you know it's my first um, um world cup that i saw in, in color it was one of the first ones and then i'm an arsenal supporter as well this the, the double winning team and then funny enough it was just uh, as young as back as um the 1974 World Cup final versus uh, um, Germany versus Holland, and, and I think from, from you know I always look back to that and the way the Dutch played the interaction, and then Beck, France Beckenbauer, he, he, he was he was one of my favourite players as well. So um, it develops from there, to be honest with you. And then um, obviously I, I I didn't coach really really properly till I was about 28. And that was a, a natural progression from playing. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. I, I wasn't actually going to be a coach. I didn't like. I didn't, couldn't ever see myself being a coach. I was a pretty rebellious type of character when I was a player, and um, the last person that anybody would think would be a coach was me. Um, and I and I and I had I had a bad injury, and I ended up going to Malta to play in Malta, and uh, just by coincidence, the manager got the sack. And uh, I was one of the foreign players that was earning more money than anybody else. And uh, the owner said, right, you're going you're gonna to have to coach the team. And um, I had two great f friends there, Ray Ferruja and Paul Sixsmith. Uh, Paul, Paul had played at Man United in, in the Beckham Youth team. And uh, Ray Ferruja, he ended up being the national team coach. They were in my team and they, they actually helped me a lot to, to, to coach. But player coach is probably the hardest job I've ever had, if I'm, if I'm being honest. I mean, there's so much to get into. I actually didn't know you were an Arsenal fan. So oh, um, Arsenal. <laughs> uh, let's talk about Tottenham. So let's talk about, um, I'm fascinated by coach coaching environments. And we do so much on player development. And, and we try to talk about coach development as a pathway um, and improving and self-development. A lot of coaches are in isolated environments. But that, that Tottenham environment produced... Um, I, I was over there, and, and I'm sure you know, I met you briefly about 10 years ago, and, and I, I spent a couple of hours with Kieran McKenna. Um, yeah. And I, I remember all the coaches that were there, and it was a who's who almost of over the last 10 years of impact um, at the top, top level of the English game. What, what was it about that environment from a coaching standpoint that you thought that you think drove drove that quality forward? Uh, well, John McDermott, I worked with, I worked with there. I came over back from Florida to be his assistant, and we had worked before. We'd worked before together at the FA, and we'd always been uh, um, an advocate of development of players and individual development and how players actually impact a team as an individual. Um, and and where you are as a coach, what are you actually trying to trying to achieve? 
Uh, I mean, I obviously before that I'd been influenced a lot as well by Ricky Hill, who who's, who was at at, uh, at Cocoa Beach, um, and 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 FIT, and obviously he's been at Tampa, and he, he's he's I was his assistant at Luton, but. We, uh, we, me and John would always talked about individual development of players because when you actually look at a game now, a lot of it is people talk about tactics, but most goals are mistakes or bits of magic. Um, so we we create an environment there where we where we really focus on making sure that the individual got the best possible um, coaching the best possible understanding of their character and their strengths and how we can build their strengths into super strengths and uh we were fortunate that we had you know some good disciples you know we had we had, obviously had alex Inglethorpe came in there and he was he was fantastic as well you see what he's done at liverpool and richard allen was fantastic on the recruitment um which brought the players in to help us coach coach um a good standard of player and then we had, you know, Perry Sutkin, he was there. He, he was actually the advocate, not the advocate, but he was the catalyst really for everything because the keeper was playing out from the back and he, he was very good with that. So there was there was a good initial cohort of people there that that uh, followed what we want, what we wanted to do. And then obviously we brought in people like Ozzy Abanji, Danny Buck, Bradley Adam was there as well. So he had seen a lot of different different things going on there, you know, through the years and, you know, it's always difficult when there's a change and, but he, he, he bought into what we, what we were doing. So there were, there was, there was a, a lot of um, good people there. If you think Dan, Dan Machichi, who's at Everton now and he coached England and he was the manager at, at uh, MK Donjo, it was, it was, there was, there's such a cohort of, of, of coaches that had gone there, but you all got to be on a similar page, you know, and obviously Kieran, and you've got Matt Wells there now as well. That uh, Matt Wells is first team coach there, but he, he was Scotty Parker's Scotty Parker's assistant. And um Kieran obviously John John mentored him. So the environment of, of everybody pushing everybody and everybody trying to understand what creates an individual that can go into a team um was the thing that was that that most helped us to help the players be, become better. And one of the main things is that people got to realise is that a team doesn't go into a youth team doesn't go into a first team. So most people are part of the journey, part of the vehicle, and where where their career career ends up is probably not going to be at your club at, at, at in the first team. If you can get one one out of every youth team, you've you've you've, you've done brilliant. But to understand that you've got an obligation to the players as individuals, an obligation to make sure that they reach their potential regardless of where they end up is, is what drove us, really. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, speaking of individuals that, that may break into that level, which is the, the smallest percent of a percent, the two, the, uh, obviously Harry Kane's journey, the going lower leagues and going back and getting different experiences, but also... Again, I was on Wikipedia last night, just just refining the research, and I looked at that you coached in the '99 England England under twenty team, and I was saying, oh, I wonder who was in that there, and and you had a Peter Crouch centre forward. Uh, yeah, and, and I was fortunate that year or those years when I joined the FA, I had a steep learning curve. I was Howard Wilkes' assistant, and then in um, and then I was Les Rees' assistant in uh, in the, the under sixteens in the uh in the euros so I've, I've i've been fortunate to work with some good people there you know kenny swain's mind hunters steve Ratter, paul smallies people like that who who were in there but two of the biggest influences for me was uh dick bait he was absolutely outstanding mentor for me and craig simmons so when you, i look at the people that i've actually been exposed to it's 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 been monumental for me um and I worked with some good people, you know, in that under 18s year, under 18s team that year, we had uh, Steve Gerrard, Ashley Coles, Lady Kings, um, just just pe people like that, you know, that that you know you, you go through and it's a who's who. Um, so I, I've been I've been really fortunate to 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 be involved in that, and as a young coach there as well, I learned so much. You know, you look back now and you put put your hands over your face and think, you know, what was I doing? But you know, it was an invaluable experience, invaluable experience for me. So um, all those things add to your journey. Whenever that, that 
philosophy around you mentioned there about you and John McDermott about that individual and getting that individual through and that individual has to be like something that I've 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 saw in the research that I've done and some of your work has been that it's not defined on a system, so it's defined no. on a skill set. On a um, style. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, what we look at is first and foremost, every job has a job description. So the higher up you go, the more refined your job becomes. If you're a centre half and you can't stop the turn or you can't head the ball, you're not going to be one. But what we try and do is in, in, ensure that the players, when they first we talk about the bottom of the pyramid, which is extreme technique. So if you are an extremely technical player, then it's down to how, what, how do you understand movement and how do, you, how do you understand any philosophy that you've been put into? So there's different things, obviously, physical capabilities come into it as well. But that's where, as a coach, you have to understand what someone has to offer physically and, and emotionally. So all those things are put into the pot, but mainly we, we try to make sure that they maximise their level of technique. So we don't want, you know, how many times do you hear when people say someone's got a good touch for a big man? You know, we don't want that. What we want is people that can play in good possession football, but plus have an individual ability to to screen the ball, to stay on the ball, to to use dif different uh, bits of advanced core skills to to create problems for the other team and also get out of individual problems themselves. So most of the most most of the time it isn't based on a system what we want is players that can play for different managers so they can play in different systems they have a good game understanding and they have the techniques to play in the system or the philosophy that that, that they find themselves in is that a lot of supplemental work alongside the technical uh, is that i remember when i was there it was a uh, at tottenham I, I believe there was a 15 or 20 minutes where the players had their own time after sessions at younger age groups? Was it, is it little things like that there that you implement? Yeah, because I think sometimes you, experimentation is generally where people can make unpressured mistakes, um, can try things, because there's things that you can't teach. You can't teach the kids. And you have to also realise what they bring to the, they bring to the, to, to the, to the, to the party. So sometimes you have to allow them to try little knuckleball shots or little little touches that 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 are in their in their in their own personal DNA. Um, and the last thing you want to do is is try and coach that out of them, unless it's something that's going to stop them moving forward. Obviously. Um, so I think it's always important. Sometimes sometimes people look at my sessions and they think that they're messy or unstructured, but they're actually more structured because I'm, you know what you're trying to you're trying to achieve by allowing people to have the freedom especially the young players the freedom to experiment and during that experimentation is, is is probably where most of the learning happens a lot of the learning happens yeah that's, that's so interesting because we're at a time now where there's a lot of even argentina like scolari's talked about it about coaching out of players coaching that creativity out of players do, do you see that in an era of a little bit more pre-professional sciency era that we're currently in well the, pro the problem is i think people don't realize that all the stats and the science was there before it just wasn't as glossy but what it is now is is it's so easily accessible that people look at things probably more in 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 a square box clean than they actually understand uh, i mean for argument's sake you watched the game on on saturday um saturday or sunday liverpool versus man united Fantastic game. Everybody says a fantastic game. Just talking about this with John the other um, a couple of days ago. I was saying it's a fantastic game because the defending was poor, <laughs> and there was a lot of scruffy finishing. You know, people finishing on the turn quickly. You know, and, and, and stuff like that. Very few, very, none, hardly any of the goals were planned goals that you would say you can go and work on. Or we talk about tactics. We talk about low block, high block, high press. You know, lots of the times people don't, don't, they just say it and expect people to know it. And they, and, and um, it, it, people do, a lot of things happen. People are, are, are a lot more just functional players. There's a lot of just functional players now who are, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're not technically good, but they're part of a cog. They're just a cog in a machine. Mm -hmm. Now, generally, unless you're a high level cog, you're probably not going to go any further because you're just somebody who's, can play play in a team but can't play in another team because you 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 learn systems of play rather than 
the ability to to maneuver the ball, pass the ball, create bits of magic, or even if you're a defender, what you what if you're on fullback, what are your six passes, essential passes? You know, we're talking about hitting the seven, hitting hit, hit, hit the nine, hitting the channel, hitting the midfield player. You know, we're talking about do people actually look at that and say, right, these are the essential passes for this position? If you're a ten, what sort of ten are you? Are you a, a 10 that comes off the nine and plays? Are you a 10 that runs in behind? Are you a, a midfield 10 that sits in front of the, the, the two or the three midfield players? What type of 10 are you? You know, So people look at a, a system of players and say, it's right, we need this type of 10 or this type of nine. Now, unless you've got money to go out and actually prescriptively buy that for a first team, then what you're doing is letting the kids down because you're not taking into consideration who's in front of you. So lots of times people, they play the game and they, they think, right, if we can play this pretty, this pretty game of football, which has gone too much the other way now. I know before we were very direct and it was all for one and everybody getting stuck in and it was ugly. But in the end, both have the same outcome because if you're just the cog in a pretty game of football, you got to think to yourself, where are most players likely to play? Most players are not playing in the top half of the Premiership. Most players are playing in the, 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 the rest of the league where it's roll your sleeves up on a windy day. And can you now have that ability to play in the hustle and bustle and still be able to express yourself? So, so, so one of the things that we try to do, we try to get people prepared for the eventualities of not being in a top six team being in this top six program, uh, you know, they have to be able to do both. So it's very important that you, you, you try, try to, to, to get the players to, to, to understand that game understanding with their technique and movement is probably what's going to get them to where they need to be. Hello, coaches. We'll take a quick break here. Huge thanks to everyone who joined us last week on the Modern Soccer Coach Designing Your Game Model webinar. If you missed it, you can get the replay access on the link below. Full webinar is available. Two hours we did covering philosophy, values, establishing the principles. I go through all the principles that I would have in a game model. Training methodology, how to design sessions around your game model. And also then analysis and review process to support all the game model structure. Every coach that registers receives a customizable game model template that you can edit and adapt to your own philosophy and your own team. Link is available on the link below. You can get yours today. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, I saw uh, one of your presentations that you I believe you did over the lockdown, and it was it was player development, almost principles. But you, you were saying about attacking player, very simple. Can they score? Can they create? And I believe it was uh, progress possession or, or deal with the ball. In today's world, database, but like you, you're. I, it just struck me as the simplicity of if you're going to make it at the next level, you would need to be really, really effective at those three things. Well, the thing is, what is we have four, four, four things in and out, and we have the glue. So four things in: can you score? Can can uh, can you create? Can you maintain possession, or can you get something out of it? Now, obviously, the young ones we're not we're not saying that. Then on the other side, you're looking at um, uh, can you win it? Can you make play predictable? Can you support the first defender? What's your team function? So most players, most of the time, are in maintain possession and team function. Because you, you, you only touch the ball between a minute and two minutes in a game. So most time you're going to be in those two, in those two things. So, so on, 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 the, on those sides. And it's, it's at any time understanding where you are on the pitch and which one of those four things in or out of possession that you are, you're at. Now, the... the the, the 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 glue the glue to it is is people understanding what's going on around the ball on and around the ball <laughs> what's your movement what's your timing what's your execution so to give you an example if you are a a an attacking player on the other side of the wing and the other on the other on 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 on, on the left wing and on the right wing you have a, a winger who's got the ball right so how deep is he? Where is he going to cross it to? Is he ready to cross? What's his body language like? So is, is there somebody running around him? So you, you make your runs based on all those initial processes that, you, that, that, that you're talking about. Now, as soon as you, as soon as you, as soon as you compute what's going to happen, 
you start moving what's your movement are you running on the back of the of, of the furthest defender are you running behind him or are you going to try and run 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 in front of him once you've decided that based on what you what what you think is going to happen when the cross comes in now you've got tempo what's your timing is it quick is it slow um how do you get there and then what's your execution are you heading it are you volleying it what bat are you what bat are you using are you setting it so that happens in every execution on on the pitch so getting coaches to try and understand that these are the things that individuals need to be aware of when they're on the pitch of how how they're actually going to perform rather than reacting to something with with no cleverness and just hoping that they can use their physicality or to to to, to out muscle somebody um so if you look at someone like if you look at a lot of youth football where the bigger players score and nobody really coaches them and until they get to a level where everyone's on a similar physical basis they've got no cleverness no moves no dark arts but you look at some big players like a duncan duncan ferguson um even les ferdinand uh peter crouch um uh, harland now they all had dark arts and movement and craft in in the, in the, in 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 their movement alan shearer big big player not you know big and strong player but got craft in their movement so that helps their power and strength for them to for them to to execute what they need see see when you almost reverse engineer that then you go back to what you're saying there about the about the older more physically advanced player that's going to stand out at the youth level should coaches be spending more time challenging those types of players that are that are getting by on their physical qualities uh no what they got what they should be doing is teaching them what they teach the others and everyone will find the level that they are so if they accelerate then you should, you should have another page to teach them more so everybody learns the similar thing but they 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 they, they eat the diet that they like don't they so the people who who if you're a small player and you're a center forward you might be one that ducks in front so it's still running to the near post but how you run to the near post it might suit you different you you as a coach has to quickly we talk, I talk about the zone of proximal development which is the challenge point where is that player on, on, on there where can you challenge them to get better and then if 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 sometimes we go too far ahead we go too far ahead we teach people things that they're not ready to learn and a lot of coaches don't want to teach simply kicking the ball they don't want to teach that you know i remember uh, les and tim um uh let's find and tim sherwood when they came and joined us joined that joined the clubs the 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 development squad which was an extension of the academy and they totally bought into what we were doing there and they added they added based on their their experience and their international experience and the levels that they'd been at so they actually they they they, they added to the players and they were developers as well so they developed they helped develop the players that came out of the academy um and it was just little things about how you strike the ball about your back lift on the ball stuff like that when you're shooting as a forward as a midfield player you know how how you use your body and and stuff like that now these are these are not things i'm saying we didn't teach as a younger age but you can then you have to move it to the next level where players can actually take it into the league football um, and play against their peers. Uh, that piece as well you talked about play where you are was one of the was one of the principles. Is that is that what you're saying about the player having to compute quickly to make that thirty second opportunity that comes in the middle of the game? That's part of it as well. Yeah, I mean people talk about now with fullbacks rolling inside and all this. Well, what I'm talking about is we added you know we the rotation part of the game, which is what I I not me only it's not you know obviously this was developed with, by a team of people but um we you know what i really liked about the dutch teams back in the day when they used to interact um i don't know if you ever see uh germany versus holland uh the world cup final if you go and look at it johan Cruyff ends up as the sweeper yeah. receiving the ball before he runs with it when he won the penalty yeah, yeah, when he started, the penalty, yeah, ends yeah. up as a sweeper and he runs with it. But you look at the centre halves out wide, the full backs are tucked inside, this and that and the other. So what it is is you, you if you if you have good technique and you have game understanding, like even playing the little boxes, what they call rondos now, but they're playing the little boxes. If you can play five a side, you can play anywhere on the pitch. 
So it means if you if you can quickly interchange and, and emerge somewhere, create overloads quickly because you're not worried about stepping into midfield and playing there as, as, as a centre-half or, 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 or what they call it, holding midfield player now or whatever it might be. It means that if the ball breaks down, you don't need to run back 20, 30 yards. Because of the, because of the rotations, your, face, your space should be filled in. Someone else should fill your space in. So it means you end up as a, as a winger and you end up, the two's gone past you and crosses it and hits the first man. You should be able to run back and fill his space or her space. You should be able to do that. And then for 20, 30, for 30, 60 seconds, while the play is going on, the other player fills your space. And if the ball goes over the other side, you should know as that as that number seven that you have to tuck over. You should just know, just know that. You should, you should, oh, well, the ball's gone inside me because I'm the number seven. I don't know. I, I didn't know what to do. Now, you might not be the expert playing there, but you know for that 30 seconds or 60 seconds, you're playing as a fullback to the best of your ability. So that people understand in that 30 to 60 second window is is it really really important in movement in movement and overloads and 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 creating the elements of surprise where you have people people um emerging onto the scene now the other day i don't know if you saw it tottenham were playing somebody and, and they went two for two at the back now one of the one of the things about creating massive overloads is, is getting people not overloads but elements of surprise there's no overloads really because at the end of the day it's 10 versus 10 on the pitch so if you can but if people can go if people can go 1v1 and mark then you're always going to have extra players because lots of teams like cover don't they yeah so if people don't want to go 1v1 we, we, we teach cover which is great but people don't want to do that do they what they want to do is they want to they want to they always want to know that they've got that safety net behind them now i don't understand that myself uh, but one of the things that we used to, to to work a lot with the defenders was about people being able to do the stuff on their own because in the end of the day it's 1v1 when it boils down to it so you think about it if you have the, you have a corner and they leave one person up the other team would always leave two people back now, I, I challenge you this. Do a drill where the goalkeeper picks the ball up and you put a defender, no one else on the pitch, an empty pitch. You have a goalkeeper at each end of an 11-a-side pitch. And get the goalkeeper to catch it and just kick it as long as he could, long, as long as he can. How many times will the forward score? Probably would never score, would he? <laughs> He'd never score. <laughs> so, so, therefore... We're, we're saying, well, it's a 1v1 and the keeper's got to kick it 60 yards. He's got to bring it down and beat the flatter and beat the keeper and get the ball on target. Doesn't, doesn't happen, does it? Wouldn't, would, it wouldn't happen if you did it in a drill. Well, just on that, uh, what was your thoughts on the Van Dijk, Haaland 1v1? One, one one? Uh, it got a lot of traction, a lot of people talking about whether it was good defending, bad defending, when he was backing up and backing up. What did you think of that? Yeah, no, he backed off, and he backed off. If Harlan if Harlan hits that properly, he scores. You you are you're in the camp of bad defending, or or he should have done more. I'm in the camp of he could have done better. The defending could, in my opinion, if the fella hits that correctly, he scores. Mm. So to me, there has to be a point of engagement. There has to be a point of engagement. The only reason is is either bad defending or not, is it? Because if he just the fact that he didn't score doesn't make it a good defending, does it? So yeah. I would I, I would think that what well, one or two things isn't for, was far for me to cast aspersions on Van Dyke, who I think is absolutely fantastic. Probably. I I I I would I would say that he probably needed to usher him wider earlier. Um and Harlem would be disappointed that he didn't strike the ball properly. I'd say looking in. It looks like England are in a wave of like development uh, players coming through over the last five years, probably. And you look at some of these young players that are now coming through. It looks that they're reaping the rewards of E Triple P and environments. But then again, when I look at that team that that, that you were coaching in '89, you talk about Cole and Crouch and Gerrard, and you're talking about world class players. What well, we've seen the last twenty five years, what of it? 
has it been better environments? Are we uh, are we in a in a at a time where England are producing more technical players? Or uh, what's your thoughts around that? Uh, well, if you actually go back through the England teams, go if you go back through them, well, you don't tell me Ray Wilkins wasn't a technical mm. player or the Frank Worthington or Stan Bowles or there's always they've always had good players. The, the, all the England teams have always had good players. You, you, well, like I said, you go to Brian Robsons and people like that. You know, you look, you look, at, you look at people like that back in back in the day. Um, if you look at it, you, I think we're in we're in a, a position now where we can compete with the best, with 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 the, with the best uh, players. I think we have produced some fantastic players at um, at this time, and I think that. Uh, with what Gareth's done by assembling the players to actually reach the heights they've, they've, they've done uh, in a world where all the all the countries have top top players, I think it's 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 uh, it's been a myth in the last few couple of decades that English coaches are not good because of the style of play that uh, that, that happened in the eighties and stuff like that. And I think we I think that the English coaches have been tarnished with of the long ball game, which you know was prevalent back in back in 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 those days, but I think there's always been good players in the national team. Always, there was a headline today just before uh, we jumped on on the Guardian front page. Of the Guardian: When will the US produce a soccer coach who can gain respect in England? Um, and I thought, God, I must ask Chris that one, having most experiences in America and experiences over here. Um, what do you think about coaches coming over from America? Well, they haven't done bad, have they? Let's be honest. We, we, we're saying when will they when will they produce someone? They, well, they've come and they've coached, and they've not. They've uh, it was it Bob and Jesse. You know they've come, they've coached, they've they've had their levels of of, of uh, success and failures. No different to anybody else. I, I I don't I don't see them any different. To, to the, the coaches that have, that have come here. You know, they've not been given war chests to go out and spend. They've come in difficult situations at different different uh, clubs. I, I think there's a bit of snobbery about it as regards the fact that the terminology that they use in America is different to the terminology that we use here. Um, and, you know, I mean, I've coached, obviously, as you know, I coached in the USL against many uh, 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 American coach. Um, I don't, who I would, I, I wouldn't be looking down my nose at them at any stage of the game. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, all right, back on task. Um, let's move from player development to coach development. And I wanna you you talk about the the, the brilliant environment for coaches at uh, at Tottenham. And I wanna ask you when you went to QPR, then was that a cultural change? Did you have to build something there in terms of that coach? Uh, environment that coach culture uh yeah i mean look Q, qpr had, had um you know a situation there where before we came this i wouldn't want to say that, that what those are is good or bad because situations are you don't produce players not only because you've got a bad coaching culture it's probably probably it, the environment doesn't lend itself to, itself to that but what we what we tried to do is well what we did was brought the formula that we had already had in uh, at Tottenham. We brought it there because it, it, it's a style. It's not a this is stick to this club or this is something that, that that I believe can be moved anywhere as long as everybody's on on page with it. You know, it's like like it, like anything. So it was a massive cultural change for a lot of people. We lost people along the way, which is you know what 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 you do when things are, uh, are changing. Um, yeah, and, and and but we had some really good disciples there, you know, you know Paul Halls now with the first team, and Andy MP and Paul Furlong, and Micah Hyde, you know, all the senior coaches were 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 were, were on board, so it did help to to influence the rest of the, the the club, but also I coach every day, so if people are not doing what what we've asked them to do, then then you take over and you. You do it because in the end, we forget the clients. The clients are the players and the parents. So it's like anything. If you're in a school and there's a teacher not doing the syllabus, you're not going to just allow them to do it. 
you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna either remove that that teacher uh or or um do it yourself how do you balance them between coach coach leadership like quality control like you're saying they're following the curriculum doing delivering what needs to be delivered and then not micromanaging people like how do you get that balance right i don't think you do initially mm. i don't think you do because like i said it's like anything with if you've got a child and they go to a school you're not going to allow a, we all talk about giving people freedom to this to you know express themselves and all that we 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 forget but if you have a, a coach that doesn't do it for three years, that's 60 kids that have gone through his hands that have not, that, you know, that have not had the right experience. That you wouldn't do that in a school. You wouldn't allow 60 kids to fail their exams, would you? You, you wouldn't allow it just so that the coach can gain experience. You wouldn't do that. So what you do is try to help the coach get uh, 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 improve or stick to the plan, or you'd have to get someone who's competent enough to make sure that that the the players get what they need which i think a lot of the times in coach development we forget that's what we're working we're working with players mm. that element then is that coach recruitment is that something that you've been big on as well going out and identifying coaches that that fit a set of uh, a culture or an environment uh you 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 Coach recruitment is very difficult in London. You've got 14 professional clubs and in, in and around uh, uh, QPR. You've got Chelsea, Brentford, you've got Wimbledon, you know, you've got Fulham. So it's slim pickings. So a lot of the times people say, oh, can we get the best coaches? No, you can't get the best coaches. You get the best coach that can get to your training ground by five o'clock, who's got a B licence and a youth award. That's what you get. Now, you hope that then that you get people that want to stick to your to the program a lot of young coaches are boy racers and a lot of co young coaches want to move too quickly ahead of the game before they actually understand the, the game and how to coach because we forget coaching is teaching so knowledge isn't teaching you can know a lot and not be a good teacher so i would sooner the personality first and the knowledge second so listen, they have to have a, 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 a base knowledge, but I would rather someone who, who, who's got personality, can connect with the players, who has, a, not limited, but has a base knowledge, than someone with a not a knowledge. I, I would pick, I'd pick the personality over, over, over the knowledge all day long. Yeah, very interesting, because we could be now entering potentially a, a new generation which, which is like yeah more tech savvy more knowledgeable but also we're losing a little bit of that communication that personality i uh, i i believe that uh, would you agree uh, i think 100 percent. i'd agree 100 percent. i think everything's tactical everything's stats and like i keep saying people think when when i sort of talk like that people think well you're a dinosaur i said no but stats have always been there mm. people forget that you know, there was a there was a book called A Winning Formula years ago, but written by Charles Hughes. And people, you know, if you, if you look back at that book, people say, well, that's where the long ball came from. It didn't. It was a book of stats. How many times you do this? How many times you do that? That's what it was. But people choose to interpret it, the use of it by saying, right, if you get the ball in the final third X amount of times, you're going to score. So let's miss the midfield play team out and get it. that. That stands at you in your your interpretation of it so there's always been stats but people tend to think that the stats win the game no they don't the stats win the, the stats and mistakes make you win the game very few very few games are won totally on tactical uh, uh, announce very few most games are won because people have carried out the game plan better than the other one in the end it goes down to a 1v1. Someone crosses it, someone out jumps someone, they head it in. It's a 1v1 in the end. <laughs> so I think, I, think, I think you're right. You know, we're losing that little bit of communication. Yeah, and, and then you merge that. With, so I've never heard that phrase before, but I really like it. The boy racer, the coaches that are just in a rush to get the, 
Premier League level, you you mix yeah. that with a lack of maybe a little bit of communication skills or a bit of personality, and then you've got it's not a great mix for a, for a kid. That no, no, and and they always you know one of the things they, that people tend to do, they will always refer to the end product player. So you're you're trying to sell right. We 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 understand role modeling is important. So people will look at look at at the Bruyne or they'll look at, you know, as Javi or in the end. Yeah, great, great. That's where you want to get to. But you're, that's so far away from your zone of proximal development. You People don't scaffold the teaching. Who, who who can you actually reach? If you're an under 13 and there's an under 14 that's excelling, you can reach him or her. You can reach that person. What are they doing that you're not doing or what are they doing better than you? So sometimes we have to we have to make sure that the, the players are role modelled by the people that they can actually get to. So they so so their level of success is 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 scaffolded incrementally over a period of time. Whereas sometimes we say, well, so and so done this run and then that run. No, I keep saying to people, Iniesta wasn't Iniesta at twelve. People were talking to him about somebody else. You know, you know, at, at, at that time, they might have been talking to him about Gucci or someone like you. Do you understand? You understand what I mean? So they've got to understand that that people develop into the famous person that they become. They become. They're not that at, at, at that age. And a lot of players who become very top top players weren't weren't brilliant as, as kids. They weren't. They 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 had to grow into it. So patience is massive when it comes to developing players. Brilliant. All right, last one for you. Um, patience, yeah. Uh, merging that formal education in an environment, you know, you mentioned the B license coach that you're trying to get there. Are you, I, I would imagine that you're trying to get that coach and, and filter or feed into the, the development of getting better CPD events, kind of that self-development drive that you want in those coaches as well. Is that something that's a priority in, in that level? Yeah, I mean... When you look at, say, so a club like QBR is a great, great club, great fans, great owners. And obviously, Les brought me in, um, you know, with, with his experience of, 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 uh, of, what, of, of what we've done at Tottenham as well. Um, we were very much into the CPD as regards the, even the development squads, you know, the development um, um, part of the club. Uh, where we get we get the, the players that you know they're not quite in the academy but they're outside the academy. So we try to make sure you know for our recruitment, Gary Carson's there with Lee McCarthy. With Lee McCarthy, they they integrated all the scouts into the, the development program. So when we had CPD, we'd bring them in. So they would look at they would see sort of the type of players that we like, how how they would fit into what we want. And, and I think that's really important in your CPD to, to bring everybody in. So every time there's a conversation, it's a common language. It's not just the language that people are talking about over there. So all the time, all the time that they, uh, that they do things that the players are sure about where, what our identity is. And then I'm going to che- I'll sneak one in again. Coaches that are dealing with resistance in that aspect of, again, you're well aware of the American landscape. A lot of listeners over here, coaches that are managing 30, 40 coaches potentially at a club. And they're saying, God, there's there's always two, three, four doing their own thing and, and all of that. What advice would you have for them to try and get that quality control and that culture in? Uh, I think to start with, you deal with sugar, give them sugar. I think you 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 try to see where they're coming from and why, um, but I think eventually uh, when we went into to Tottenham, myself and John, we had a uh, an acronym, which you're probably going to have to fill the work, fill fill fill, fill, fill the uh, the bits in yourself is FIFO. So that was it, really. In the end, it's a FIFO scenario because you can't have one of the things that's been hard. Even when you go and change something, if you're you're you, if everybody's happy, you're probably not doing the job right. Because if you've got ten people and you've got two or three boy racers, and everybody else is doing that doing the job, they're not going to be happy. So you you've got to think about the flock. If the flock is happy, that's where you need to be at. And the one or two that are not happy, no matter how good they are, they have to go. 
because you get that one bad apple and then that before you know it everyone's on, on not on the same page and i always say to the coaches if you're a school teacher you can't just go into a school and just teach what you like if the syllabus is teaching the romans you can't just come in and teach henry the eighth you can't do that you you have you have to teach what the syllabus is um but lots of them yeah but you're killing my creativity but i keep on saying to, to, to a lot of the young coaches coaching isn't about how pretty the game looks or or whether you win or what coaching is getting the best out of the people in front of you so if the best the people in front of you are better at playing a direct game of football then that's what you do you you get the best out of the people in front of you. coaching is about just maximizing that person's potential the best that you can best that you can and and if if if, if you your i you might have an idea but you're teaching and if people don't don't uh understand what you're doing you have to find a way to make sure that they do, that, that they do it and you have to also understand what their strengths are and what their capability are is that's why the program is a strength-based capability program do you know what i mean what's your strengths and what you're capable of and then 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 that because you're only ever going to do what you're capable of aren't you? and most of it is back down to your strengths brilliant what a way to finish it chris thank you so much this has been the fastest move an interview i've ever done uh i'm, I'm, I'm gutted <laughs> i wish it was always was really longer fantastic thank you well listen look thanks a lot for inviting me it's been it's been an honor to be on